money is more abundant than any commodity in the world but your time is a lot more limited you can only live to a certain age you only have a certain amount of time it's a lot more of a finite commodity and we value things based on their rarity gold and diamonds are expensive not because they're magical or can do anything because there's a limited supply and i think that's the same way as you become more successful or aspire for more success you realize where value really lies Hello and welcome to another episode of the Need to Succeed podcast where we have incredible conversations with phenomenal entrepreneurs and just to understand what is their need to succeed. Because here's the thing, two people can go through the exact same situation. One person decides because of that situation, they can no longer achieve the things that they want to achieve in life. And the other person decides because of the exact same situation, they have to achieve all of their dreams. Same situation, different outcome. What is the mindset of the successful entrepreneur? That is exactly what we look to uncover on this podcast. And today we have an absolutely incredible guest. This is someone who I've been watching with glee from afar, just looking at all of the incredible things that they've been doing within this space. He is a property expert, an entrepreneur. He is Mr. Kazim Ali Balogun, a.k.a. Property by Kazi. <laughs> Appreciate What's you. Appreciate up, you for that fantastic, fantastic intro. <laughs> so I, can, I can tell fellow, fellow Nigerian from the, the excellent pronunciation Come of on. my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro, we've probably been through the same. Yours is more difficult. Mine is Ibrahim. Mm. Easy. So I'm like, people are getting my name wrong then. You must have been going through a whole lifetime of just dealing with it. Yeah, you get, you know, on a call center, they say like, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ali uh, and they kind of wait for me to prompt to just finish it they don't even bother sometimes but we get there we get there <laughs> bro honestly it's a pleasure having you in the studio um, you, just like I said in the introduction man you've been you've been you've been doing this right? you've been doing this and it's been great just kind of looking from afar and seeing you know all of the good that you're doing in this space man thank you bro thank you been been trying man been trying to just share some of my journeys like the opportunities that I've had to hopefully you know be able to give those to other people it's crazy. Do you know one of the ones? Um, one of the ones that I saw, and I said, "This guy's just taking the piss." Mm. You probably don't remember this because you're just creating content. But I remember, you did one, and I think it was like a little seven-second clip, and it was it was something like, "Ah, oh, where's where's all that money going?" or something like that. And then you just opened like it was like your your key box, <laughs> open it and just bare keys just drop out. Do you remember that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, nah, he's taking a piss. There's no space left in that key box. And it was a big one as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, the multi, so, the multi levels. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible, bro. Incredible just what you've been doing, man. Um, but bro, let's get into this. Let's no get problem. into this. So on this podcast, we'll go to tradition. Mm -hmm. So the first and the last questions are the only set questions. Everything oh. else is just free flow. Let's go. Let's see where we goes, right? Um, so let's get started. Very first question. Mm -hmm. What does success actually mean to you? Um... I think definitely over time, success has changed in terms of what it means to me. And I think that's a natural progression because the more you have, the more you value different things. Mm. So I think I'm at a point in my life now where success means me being able to do things that I want to do, that I prioritize on my own time and on schedule. So whereas before I felt like I was always being pulled from pillar to post, come to this meeting, come to that meeting, come here, come there. Now my, I can, I'm in a position where I can say, okay, I'm going to do this meeting. You come to me at this time and we make this happen. And I feel like that gives me the flexibility to do other things that I prioritize. I think being able to control my own micro world is probably what success means to me. That's amazing, bro. I think at the core, like a lot of people, if you ask them that question, mm -hmm. which I do, that's literally the question I've mm -hmm. probably, what we've we done now, 60 plus episodes. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, probably, you know, a lot of people um, at the core of it, that's that's what it comes down to. But if you ask people this question, they're probably going to say money, I want to be able mm -hmm. to do. But like, actually, what do you want that money for? Because it's like, okay, if you look at it like this, how much money is there in the world? There is basically unlimited pounds, mm -hmm. dollars, 
pesos, wherever it is, for well. there's unlimited, like, you know, there's, there's money is more abundant than any commodity in the world. Mm. But your time is a lot more limited. You can only live to a certain age. You can only do a certain, you only have a certain amount of time. Like it's a lot more of a finite commodity mm. and we value things based on their rarity. Gold and diamonds are expensive, mm. not because they're magical or can do anything, because there's a limited supply. Mm. Like, and I think that's the same way, you know, as you become more successful or aspire for more success, you realize where value really lies. Yo, bro. Do you know what? I've, I've, I've heard this. Mm. I don't know whether you, you realize kind of what you've said there, but... I've heard this point, and, and the way other people try to do is they try to bring their mortality to today mm. and really kind of look death in the eye and say, yeah. you, know, you know, what happens if today's my last day? Mm. But the way you've just described time there, I've not mm. heard anyone kind of describe time in that way, which is, well, actually, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a commodity. Mm. It's like gold, it's like diamond. And we value these things, like, you know, precious diamonds. You know, we literally put a price on that. Mm -hmm. If we value time in the same way, bro, if people could actually just look at and value time in that same way, I genuinely think the way people look at things will change. Yeah, I think you would look at things a little bit more differently. And obviously, time is a commodity that transcends in that it moves, its value changes with age. Mm. So, for example, when you're young... It's like fine wine. But no, not so much that. But when you're young, you have limited money, limited experience but one thing that you do have at your disposal is time so one of the ways a lot of people become successful is by trading their time for people who have a lack there of it so the successful businessman doesn't have the time to sit around and wait for a delivery but the young entrepreneur does so they could say you know what? i'm going to wait for your deliveries and i just want 20 minutes of your time a day for you to coach me on whatever specific niche that I want to learn about. Mm. And you can trade your time off because at that point in time, you have a more abundance of time versus the person who's trying to get theirs back. And I think trying to create that value proposition and a trade-off is a good way to maximize the resources you have at different points of your journey. Amazing, bro. Amazing. And bro, just again, just looking from afar and seeing all the mm. things that you've been doing, I genuinely feel like there is a wealth of knowledge. Mm. I, I know you do coaching anyway, mm. but it's a wealth of knowledge that people can definitely sort of glean from you. But just sort of take it back and just understand how this was started. Because sometimes people could be looking and sitting there thinking, like, oh yeah, I think we spoke about it at yeah. the start. There's all this glitz, all this mm. glamour, look all these things these people are doing, but not actually realising what journey someone has been on. Because mm -hmm, that for mm -hmm. me is really where, you know, the nuggets lie. That's where your journey lies. Don't worry about what my, my man's been through his journey, mm -hmm. right? You're sitting there watching. You need to understand what they've been through because that's what you're just about to go through. Mm -hmm. So let's just like, do, do you remember, you know, how would you describe yourself, let's say, you know, as a young boy, let's say, you know, before 10, for example, what were you like? Um, I think... <sighs> Do you know, when people talk about them being young, I always think, you're lying. I don't remember that stuff. Like, I, I know some people generally, they all remember first day of nursery school. For me, it's all, it's all a big blur. Like, I remember, like, I feel like I was always culturally, like, I was always respectful. So in terms of, like, teachers or my attitudes, they would always be like, oh, yeah, he's a nice guy. He just lacks paying attention. He's you're got a short attention span. That's a non-negotiable. Yeah. <laughs> that's just that's just how it is. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think like I was always, I'd you know, I'd probably be correct to say I was a bit a bit overly playful, you know, a bit cheeky. But generally, when it comes to my interactions with adults, I always understood time and place. And I think that's one thing that I took into the business world of understanding how to be a chameleon, that you can grow up in South London and talk a certain way, but you step into a certain room and whilst you can still be your authentic self, you need to understand how to be able to articulate yourself to be able to communicate with those within a specific space. Mm, that's powerful. That's powerful. Um, I, I know exactly what you mean, but mm. genuinely these people do. So for example, like my missus, she remembers... She was talking to mum, but mm. when she was two, yeah. and it actually saddens me because I'm like, "What are you? I don't yeah. remember when I was ten, eleven, twelve. Like yeah, this is it's all for me. Anything from the age of like five up until like 
15 is like one big blur of it could have all happened in a week <laughs> literally literally it's crazy but i know people genuinely mm. do because i said it's it's very very close to home okay cool so you 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 feel like so you were you were someone who was quite studious you were quite respectful and you'd mm. always just kind of listen to people do you feel though like because that was, there's obviously a lot of people like that mm. would you say do you remember because um they say there's there's normally something at a young age you know, an experience that you go through that significantly kind of shapes, you know, your your worldview or the way that you see the world or the way that you see where you would like to be in the future. Do you remember anything like that that you thought, you know what, that that was an impact for them in my life? Um, not from that young, but I remember like, so I grew up like I was probably closest to one of my cousins. He, he moved from Nigeria um, and came to, to live with us. And we were just having a conversation and my granddad, my dad's dad, who he was named after, he passed away when my dad was probably like four or five. And like, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, in Nigeria, when the man of the house kind of passed away at a young age, a lot of the assets, the money, the things like that kind of got dispersed and weren't looked after the way they were supposed to be. And I remember him kind of sitting with me and just being like, you know what, brother, like, there's like our parents, like obviously we were kind of here and then because of that unfortunate like passing, it like took where we kind of were as a family down but it's like so our parents have kind of taken the baton and they've run with it and they've done as much as they could and it's like our job to take that and take it to the next level and I think that really stuck with me that I've kind of got a responsibility within my family to excel the the nucleus of like my family as, as far as possible and I think so whenever you have those days where you feel like I'm tired or I feel like I can't be bothered I feel like you know what there's there's a responsibility on myself that, you know, there's there's people that look up to me, there's people that like I want them to look up to me and I want to be able to help. And I think just having a goal that, you know, you want to excel and do good for the, the greater, your local community, I think is something that really stuck with me. That's amazing, bro. And what, what sort of age was this? So I was probably like, I want to say like maybe 40, no, like 15, I think. 15, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that, that's actually a good age because... It's only really a few years to go where you can really start putting your foot down and saying, mm -hmm. okay, this is the way I'm going to channel it. That's the way I'm going to channel it. But but at that age, like having that sort of, I guess, heavy burden or this like huge responsibility, internalizing in that way, how did you how did you kind of process that? Not not processes mm -hmm. in all, oh, but were you thinking, okay, I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that? or I think at that age... I didn't feel that heavy as the head moment. Yeah. What I more felt is that it was just fuel to the fire to keep me working hard. Mm. I didn't see it as, oh, well, I've got all this responsibility. I more saw it as like, you know what? I don't have excuses. So I just want to keep working hard. So from the age of 15, I had my first job and I worked up until I set up my own company at wherever it was, like 22, 23, for example. So that was like, I had a long career of working. I'd always, whether or not I was school, college, university, I'd always been working. And the days where you feel like, oh, my friends are just going out to play football. I think that being in the back of my mind, I didn't have the excuses where I felt like, oh, I can't bother to go work. I just want to chill this summer. Mm, that's great. What, what was your first job? So my first job, well, my first job was a, a paper round, like a lot of people's first, mm. first jobs. Um, and yeah, so first job was a paper round and then went from there, was working in Primark, um, in Credum when it first opened. I think, bearing in mind, I was probably 15 because I got a late birthday, um, 15, 10 and 16. I think I was probably on three pounds something an hour. Free, do you know what I mean? So, and I was grafting, like doing doing my Saturday, Sunday, I'm probably taking home like, what, 200, 300 pounds a month? <laughs> Big money. From, from, yeah, so Primark. Then I say, I then I went to Phones for You. Phones for You was probably like a big game changer for me, and kind of go on to where. But Phones for You, I did a shift at Phones for You for a while. Learned learned a lot there, and I think one thing I'd say for a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs is don't like discount the value of working in a nine to five or the experience you get from working for somebody else because the skill sets that I learned, whether or not that was commitment to showing up on time and getting a job done speaking to people like building relationships from primer whether it was the sales experience of um you know being able to build relationships report upselling cross-selling um compliance etc that i learned on phones for you all of these skills 
I then took the teachings that people have paid like probably tens and hundreds of thousands of pounds to teach their stuff. And I got to learn that for free and effectively get paid to learn that. Mm. And I think in now everybody wants to be a boss before they learn the ropes. And I think I wouldn't, for those that are working, like make sure you 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 wring everything you can out of that experience mm. to kind of be your foundation for if you do want to go and set up on your own down the line. Yeah, it is difficult because, you know, I, I'm a massive advocate for entrepreneurship mm. because, you know, the way that I started my business is, you know, my, my mom was in mm. in a coma, like mm. during COVID, literally, mm. it's, it's life or death. We don't know what, what, mm. which way it's going to go. And I'm speaking to my, listen, I've got to take time off. You know, I'm like, mm. bro, you got all these calls coming in from Nigeria. Mm. I'm, I'm the eldest. I'm thinking about my siblings, all of this sort of stuff. Like, I've got to take time to just process mm. this and deal with all of these things happening. You know, and I'm being told, like, my clients, your clients need you. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? So for me, I'm a massive advocate. Like, listen, it doesn't matter how hard you work for these people, right? Like, in the end... You're just no, a number. I, I get that. No, I, I know you agree, is, yeah, I know you in, agree with it. In, at the same time, like, you know, it's what you learn. Yeah. When you wanted to now come and be an entrepreneur and step out on your own and you had that unfortunate 100%. circumstance that meant you had to take that leap, mm -hmm. you were taking that leap with all of these tools at your disposal to go. Facts. Whereas if you didn't have that experience, it's like, okay, I want to be a businessman or woman, but what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Fact. Now, I completely agree with mm. you. I was just using that as a preface to say, because, you know, mm. everyone listening to this knows I'm a massive advocate mm. for entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But I, I've also spoken about this before, which is, it's not all the glitz and glam if you haven't gone through the process. Like, you need to either you go and pay for mentorship and really learn and understand, you know, what you're getting into, mm. or just use that time to learn. This is free education. Like, you're yeah, getting paid, paid to, to get all of this knowledge. And this is not... And then, if you once you've made that decision, now plan. Mm -hmm. Don't say, I'm done. No, plan. Start saving your money. Start mm. putting things to the side. Start, maybe you're registering the business on the side, but stay there until you're set enough and then jump. Because everyone mm. just wants to, oh, I'm mm. not happy with this. I'm just going to jump out. Listen, when you get into entrepreneurship, there's going to be a whole bag of things you're not going to be happy with. Yeah. And jumping out, it's a bit more difficult because now you got, you got, <laughs> you're, you're the one feeding yourself. Yeah. Like I've obviously, like with a lot of things, the grass always looks greener. So mm -hmm. like you would look at things and be like, oh, they get to set their own times of when they do meetings, when they go to work, when they don't. But there's the other side of it is, okay, but also you get paid when you're sick. You know, <laughs> you get like, you get to switch off. Like I remember speaking to this friend of mine, um, Joseph, really nice guy. And he brought me to like, I hadn't, I hadn't worked in corporate space. I hadn't been in a corporate space in ages. So he took me to where he works and we're talking and he's like, oh yeah, that's, you know, where we play PlayStation. This is the pool tables <laughs> in the office. Oh, this room, the size of this podcast, yeah, this is all just where they keep snacks. It's all free. And he's like, oh, and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll call you later. He's like, yeah, but take this number card. It's for Friday. He's like, yeah, I turned my work phone off at five o'clock on Friday. Like, so that's him. He switches off. Whereas for me, it's 24 seven. I think there's always going to be things you look at that to say that I wish I had some of that, mm. but it's really understanding your personal, like internalizing, like what do you actually want out of life and what works best for you? Because mm. entrepreneurship isn't best for everybody and working isn't best for everybody. And I like, it's really understanding what you need and what you want to get out of it and what's going to satisfy your own needs. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cool, bro. So 15, you know, mm. you start working, mm -hmm. um, a couple of jobs. You said, you said something, you said phone for you was like a, was like a game changer for you. Like why yeah, was that? Yeah, like phones for you. For, like if you, if I go through my friends that worked at phones for you now, like it's su success stories on success stories. Like although the company folded in the end and went into liquidation, they had a process that I don't think other companies had at the time. Like when you start, that's a retail job, normal retail job. To start the work, you had to go to Birmingham and stay there for five days to do a training course of how to sell, how to be compliant, all of these things like, you know, they had a really good commission structure about cross-selling different products. Um, and I think a lot of the things that I learned there, I still use like, you know, now in terms of dealing with people, building relationships, managing stakeholder relationships, getting deals across the line, you know, selling, closing. So I think... That really was an eye opener in terms of arcade. Like, I'm good at this. Like this, I'm a, I'm a really good at being a people person. Mm -hmm. So let me play to my strengths. That's crazy, and 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 it's, you said it already. But that, that's why it's important that people always just look at the current situation. Mm -hmm. Don't always look at the other side, but just look at where you're at now and think, how can I maximize mm -hmm. you know this current position? But what happens after you leave funds for you? 
So I was at Phones for You while I was at university. Um, what did you start? I, I went to Bruno to start with, and I studied economics. I ended up dropping out, and I think we talk about culturally stuff and what's for you. I just went to um, university because it's kind of what everybody was doing. It's like those steps of go to school, go to college, go to university. That's just what you're doing. You're just sort of like, you're just walking along. Like, you know, when you're in the corridors at school and everyone's <laughs> just walking and you walk with them, you don't even know where you're going. You're just walking mm -hmm. with the crowd. I think that was kind of what was happening, but it was the wrong time for me. So I ended up dropping out. It wasn't really the right time. Um, and I remember kind of having this, this moment where I would say, not like that I broke down, but it was like, you know, when you go to school, all of your friends, you just go to school together. Then you go to college with everyone then you go, and everyone's in the same place. But the reality is when I dropped out of uni, my friends that didn't necessarily go to college had been working for like four years at this point and were excelling to a certain point. Because I did next year of college as well, my friends that were going to university were like finishing next year and were looking at grad jobs and grad schemes. You know, my friends that had learned a trade or had done something in that space had got a level of experience. So then at 21, I felt like, wow, like, all my peers are like excelling way past me. And like, for want of a better word, like I've messed this up. Like um, that phones for you, which is the job, like retail job that I've been at for a long time. Uh, my friends are doing well and I messed up and I kind of spoke to my dad and he was just like, that like, you're a man now, that's kind of your problem. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> like, well, yeah, I, got, I got to sort this out. So um, I went back to university and I went back like a year later, I went back to South Bank to do um, economics and, and did that, um, ended up like doing well with my degree. Um, but at the same time, I set up my well, second business, like my first proper business, second business, which is a shisha company. Um, so it was all about just looking at gaps in the market, just like five years before that, smoking ban, smoking is now illegal inside in the UK. Smokers, it's an addiction, they have to smoke. So clubs, restaurant bars are creating these lovely outdoor sm like smoking spaces. So we was approaching them saying, look, we'll do shisha in your venue. Didn't have the money to set up our own venue, but it was like a win-win, a great value proposition. You can advertise that you've got shisha. We don't charge you. We'll charge a consumer directly. We don't pay rent. You've just got an extra service, a USP to put you above your local competitors. Mm -hmm. We're providing labor, insurances, all of the products. So it was a win-win. So started doing that, went from having locations in a few places to quite a few like prominent like London clubs and locations. Um, to doing festivals that were really profitable to then getting a fixed location near my university and that was like how we grew step by step within that within that first business wow incredible first business you know well my first business was leaflet distribution expert whilst i had my paper on yeah. and I, I went to guide you know print business cards i went to all the local takeaway shops and charged them to put put extra leaflets in my in my paper on but come that was on. probably my first come on established business is that did that come natural to you the entrepreneurship i think yeah i think have you ever heard this thing they say the best entrepreneurs are lazy i haven't heard that no. so you never heard that so like mm. the best entrepreneurs are lazy because they will find the most efficient way to do something mm -hmm. so it's like in my head i'm like well i'm already going out in the cold in the rain delivery like dragging around this luminous green trolley and i'm getting paid 20 pounds but if i can get five six other people to put their leaflets in and i do the same work i'm already going out there and dropping mm -hmm. these off i can get paid double or triple so i think they'll say like the late put the lazy person in charge and they'll find a solution to do it the most efficient way <laughs> that's so sick i like that i like that okay cool so you've started the shisha business it sounds like it, it took off yeah it was good i mean like the markups on shisha at the time were like a thousand percent wow so they're a, like ridiculous margins so they're a thousand percent in terms of the shisha markup um and it was also something i enjoyed like i'd I don't, I don't drink sort of like when I went to Egypt for the first time at like sort of like 19 or 20 and I saw, oh, this is a, like something different, sociable. I actually enjoyed it, like going there. So it meant I had a passion for it. And I think when you start business, if you've got an actual passion for the product that you're selling, mm. you're a lot more likely to deliver it in a good way because you understand what is 100%. A, like, you know, a good product. 100%. Crazy. Okay, cool. So you, you've done the shisha mm. thing. Obviously now you're your property guy, mm. property by Kazi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like how does that, how does that transition? Like when, when did that start? How did that start? So during having the fixed premises, see kind of, I'm at uni, we're working 
going to uni, then going to open up at like six o'clock. We're not closing till 12. We've got to close up. We're not finishing till one home back. So it was very long day. So the money was good, made some good money. Um, but unfortunately on that first premise, we had something called a license to trade, which is different from a lease. So a lease gives you security that you can basically, you've got that property as long as it's inside like the, the lease out that you've basically got that property indefinitely. So you can spend money, you can invest on it. You, you don't own the asset, but you have a license to operate within that asset for a long period of time. Because we had a license, it meant that at any point in time, it's more like an AST on a rolling contract. We could be given our notice. So we couldn't invest into the asset. Mm. So I think it made me think about the importance of ownership. Mm. And that was the next natural step to say, okay, you know, I didn't own this asset. So couldn't invest in the business to make it as much of a long-term success as I would have wanted. Mm -hmm. So the natural progression was to say, okay, let me look at ownership. Um, and so I think at 22, 23, I took the profits from the business as, as we wound down there, there was some issues with licensing um, on that premise. Um, to go and buy my first my first property. Amazing. So you just okay. You know, I'm going to go into property now. Yeah, I remember speaking to my my broker at the time. And obviously, I didn't have full time employment. I was self employed. I was looking at purchasing a property at auction with a bridging loan, and he was like, <laughs> "This is a real baptism of <laughs> fire." Going straight in on the deep end. Yeah, like I think, but and I'm not naturally like I don't like taking risks. But the way I looked at it is like, you know, I was able to mitigate the risk as much as possible um, through the plans that we had for the property. I had an element of experience through working alongside other property developers. And it's what we um, touched on at the beginning about trading your time, being available, learning on the job. Like sometimes you don't have to get paid to get paid. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes the experience is worth more than the monetary return. 100%. So had an element of experience from going to sites, like, you know, networking with other property developers, property investors. And I was confident that, you know, this property at this purchase price made sense. How did, how did that come about? Can you just explain a, a little bit more about that in terms of, you know, getting the experience from other property developers? Yeah, so understanding, okay, it's something that I want to do. It's them really going to speak to people um, in that space already. Like there was less networking at the time because this is like 10 years ago, but speaking to people and we spoke about that trade-off of creating a value proposition. So at the time, if you're a 22-year-old and you're speaking to a 40-year-old with like decades of experience, what can you offer them? Well, you can't offer them money because you don't have it. Hmm. You can't offer them the experience because they have all of that. Mm -hmm. But what you do have is they have time. They're in a, the ascendancy of their career where they want to get their time back. So if you can say, look, I'll be on site. I'll meet with the contractors. I'll meet with the person coming from the new build warranty, the person coming from um, building control, et cetera. You're learning from meeting with them, from being available, from upping your skill set, from understanding what's a good price per square foot to pay for plastering for um, how much does, uh, you know, a new install of first and second fixed plumbing. And you're learning from obviously what they're telling you, you can go and get comparisons for them and you effectively learn by doing. I think I've always been an active learner mm. and understanding how you learn is just as important as obviously actually, or is important in terms of getting the most out of your own time as well. Powerful. And how did that first deal go? So the first deal was good. First deal was good, I think. So the first deal was something that, I still do to this day. So it was a one to two bedroom conversion from an ex-housing association purchase. Um, good because buying from housing associations mean generally speaking, the stock doesn't have a lot of nasty surprises. There can be issues within the property, but generally the legal pack and things like that are quite straightforward. Mm. So you mitigate that risk when you are purchasing an auction and then buy converting a property from a one bedroom to a two bed in London in particular, adding a lot of value. So for the person who's looking at it to say, um, well, I'm just going to refurbish this as a one bed, their ceiling price might be 270,000, but as a two bed, it might be three, two, five. So you've got more wiggle room. And the, the probably the most important lesson that I ever learned in property is you make your money when you buy, mm. like if you buy at the right price, oh, it took a little bit longer. So your finance costs went up it's insulated uh you know some extra things came up and the bill cost was a bit higher you you've you've you know prepared for that by buying at the right price even if you don't sell for exactly what it, what you wanted to sell it for a lot of those things can be saved by buying at the right price in the first place yeah 
I was watching Dragons Den the other day, mm-hmm. and this is an old episode. I love, I love mm-hmm. watching Dragons Den, Shark Tank. And just, mm-hmm. just hear how they rip into people's businesses. You, you learn from some of those mm-hmm. things, right? So, actually, I'm not doing that myself. Maybe I need to <laughs> tighten up on that, right? Um, I was watching that the other day, and this this guy came in years ago, and it was a property pitch, and he was looking. I think it was like a, a property. Um, it was a platform for mm. where lenders where they could actually lend money for property deals etc 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 and you know deborah was going well listen you know for some strange reason people that get into property when they make investment to property they think it's an ironclad investment like it's it's just weird it's, it's only in property that people make these investments and have you know this mindset about it um what's your views on what that? do you mean sorry by they think it's an ironclad investment could you like elaborate they think, they think you can't you can't lose money on it yeah, I think look, you, you can you can lose money in anything. That's the whole concept of investment. It's exactly. investing money for a potential reward, but that level of reward is generally tied to the, the level of risk. And there's different type levels of risk you can have, you know, in property investment. Like I if you buy your residential home and you buy at the right price, generally it's pretty safe. You could have some drastic issues, like for example, things that are unforeseen, like cladding issues. You can have like acts of God where there's issues and maybe it's not covered, but generally speaking, the UK- interest rate goes to 5.5%. But even that, like if you bought, you know, in 2020 and interest rates have gone up drastically, prices have also gone up over that time. So it's not that bad. So obviously because people in, well, myself, I invest in London, which number one, the UK is an island, small place. We've got an undersupply of housing. We've never met our housing um, you know, housing quota per year for the last 20 years. Then on top of that, I invest in London, um, which is one of the most desirable places to invest with, again, a limited amount of space. They're not building new land. So there's only a limited amount of space. Um, now, property investment isn't risk-free. People lose money in developments all the time. But in terms of it be intangible. If you're holding for the long term, you have a lot more security because generally speaking, like if you look at like if you if you zoom in and look at property prices, they might look like this. But if you zoom out and look at the chart, it's you know a lot more like that. Mm. I think that's probably why people have that additional level of security. Like there's a limited supply of houses. People are always going to need somewhere to live. People are always going to love to invest in the UK because it's safe, because you're, you benefit from a European legal system in terms of your um, asset protection. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things going for it that make the industry relatively low risk. That being said, you could up your risk 10 times if you want to be investing in option agreements, you want to be buying stuff off plan, you want to be doing all sorts of different, like, you know, more complex investment strategies. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, and I completely agree with mm. you. I just wanted to see in how you respond to that because it is interesting because a lot of people, mm. you know, do kind of make it sound as if it's just company. Like, listen, mm. it's it's not risk-free. You need to know what you're doing. Yeah, because like, you know, there's, again, it, it it's experience. So if you invest in an area, like it's only as risk-free as also the person that you're investing with and their, their knowledge. Mm-hmm. Because let's say somebody has got no idea about property. They could go and buy a flat, you know, we're in East London now, in East London, and someone tells me it's a great deal, buy it for 500,000, you spend 20,000 pounds, you're gonna sell it for 650. That flat could only be worth 500,000. <laughs> so just off the fact that that person doesn't know the local area, they could lose money. Mm. So that's it, like, you know, so it's all about your experience and the person that you're working with as well, I believe. 100%, 100%, so true. So what's your, I mean, I, I just kind of touched on the current mm. the current market mm-hmm. um, in, in that little segment. Like what, what's your, genuine opinion so i've heard a lot of you know financial experts Mm -hmm. some people who i i respect and you know kind of talking about we are things aren't looking good Mm -hmm. things are not looking good and it's not that actually things are not looking good right now because actually at the moment no one's actually feeling that pain Mm -hmm. but looking over the next sort of 12 to 18 months that you know a lot of the pain is going to start being felt what's your view on that because you know you you are both property developer and Mm -hmm. you know you've also graduated with what economics Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so i think it's yeah i mean how how long do we have for a question like this because there's there's a lot there's a lot to look at and to unpack um so firstly like if i say let me get my landlord hat on as a landlord like a property owner up in the uh, the buy to let market interest rates have gone up drastically. So whilst, you know, I've had some flats that maybe 
my previous mortgage was 500 pounds and we're renting out for 1,100. Now with new interest rates, we're now paying 950 pounds plus you've got your service charges plus X, Y, Z. So that flat has gone from making a healthy profit to basically breaking even. Um, but then also at the same time, although interest rates have gone up drastically because of supply and demand, um, it's, there's less properties available in the rental sector because people are not building as much build to rent because it doesn't stack on interest rates. Some people that are coming to the end of their, um, their, you know, their mortgage, their mortgage term are saying, well, it doesn't make sense for me to go on to another product because it's not going to make me any money. So they're selling. So the stock of buyer to let properties has dropped, which meant the, the demand outstrips the supply. So prices have gone up. So as much as interest rates have gone up, that's been coupled with the fact that rents have also drastically increased. So across the board, across the portfolio, if I own like 20 units, yes, I might have had some interest rates that have gone up drastically, but also I've had some rental increases where the market rent has gone up significantly as well. Mm. So overall, I think it hits most those accidental landlords with one, two properties, particularly held in their personal name with changes in taxation. Mm -hmm. And they'd be the ones that have most drastically affected for maybe people like myself that you know have properties a lot in a lot of the time in company names also that have a portfolio so you have shared risk it it's not been enough probably where you've lost on one hand you've gained on the other so it's been it's been okay um but i touched on you have seen more properties come to market with more properties coming to market, um, be that through people that it doesn't make financial sense to own their buyer to let properties or just, you know, new properties being built. There has been potentially um, an oversupply in sales and again, a, a non, that lower demand, which meant it's more of a buyer's market. So people are having to take reduced offers, slightly below market offers on their property if they want a quick sell. That being said, we haven't seen in the market market data, we haven't seen drastic reductions in prices, but what we have seen is a slowdown in the overall volume of sales. Mm -hmm. um, and I think market data in property is quite slow in that if I want to sell my property now, I look at recent sold data and we'll say, okay, I'm going to list this flat for 500,000 pounds based on recent sold data. But that recent sold data reflects the market six months ago mm -hmm. and i'm not going to sell my property for maybe enough so there's a big gap between what buy what um, vendors want for their property and what it's actually worth because market correction takes a while yeah and i feel like i've gone around the house in answering the question but the actual fact is i think there is going to be you know a slight dip in prices there's going to be a slight slowdown but i think you know we're going to see in the recent budget i don't think interest rates are going to go up again i think they're going to stabilize i think we're going to create a new sort of status quo in terms of where we are and i think prices may sort of stagnate but i don't see this you know this large recession that some of the doom and gloom people have been predicting because the reality is you know it is with rental prices going up so much the first time buyer market still strong because it is still cheaper on a monthly, you know, in your monthly expenditure to own your own home than it is to rent it. Um, you know, for those that have benefited from the capital appreciation, so people that are downsizing or upsizing, they've have a lot of equity in their homes that they're still able to buy and transition even with rates going up. And I think that same thing, you know, in terms of what I said about the most important thing in property is you make your money when you buy. Mm -hmm. So if people are saying, you know what, this is a buyer's market, a buyer's market is a time to buy. And, you know, people come into the market and seeing that there are opportunities out there will help to bolster the market as well. That was actually a very, very thorough answer. I'm glad you took your time with that. So um, that was not going around the houses at all. Um, mm. Really, really good answer. Um, but it's difficult for me to, to overlook the fact that, so for example, I mm. don't actually... Mm. particularly notice it myself but mm. my missus tells me she's like she comes back she's like bro do you, do you know how much fish is now do you know how much this is do you know how much yeah like this is like she's literally seeing the price go i don't know whether you yeah, shop yeah. but i can't see these things right mm -hmm. but like those who are actually consuming mm -hmm. they can they can they can see it yeah and, and and that's what it is like the the feedback of like you know when we talk about cost of living Cost of living, in interest rates, going all of these things, like the cost of living, for example, your daily basket of goods. So your bread, milk bar, et cetera, that going up, you feel that straight away. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the time it takes a little while for people 
to have that feeling and then see how that translates into how their spending patterns are going to change. Mm -hmm. And obviously markets are based off consumer confidence and how people feel. And again, that feedback of what that actually does to the fact that, you know, groceries and cost of living is going up, how is that going to impact, you know, whether or not people choose to buy a property? And we're going to see that over time. Um, I'm going to say, so you agree with the experts? 12 to 18 months. That's it. Because right now people are but, not, they're not quite, you, yeah. you're, you're right. Like these things are happening. You're kind of feeling the pain, but you're still just going through your day until one day you hit red line and you're like, yeah. this, this, I, I want to, but I actually can't, I can't anymore. And then that's when, you know, the... And I think whilst that that's important to consider, but then we also have to consider timing and timing is also really important. So we're coming up to potentially general elections, for example, and that's when people are going to put in policies to potentially help. So previously we had help to buy, obviously helped a lot of people to get onto the ladder, but also stimulated a lot of growth in the development sector as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whenever there, there's elections coming up in America, um, we obviously feel a lot of the trickle through effects of what happens in America. So, uh, you know, monetary and fiscal policy, it's going to be important to see what the current and potential next government do to stimulate the housing market and also to help bolster the economy. And then you've got obviously external factors um, like global politics that are also going to have an impact as well. So whilst I think nobody... Well, there are some people, but generally speaking, the general consensus is people are quite on the fence mm -hmm. because it really depends on a lot of external factors that individually, you know, us in the market can't actually impact. Well, look, the truth is, you know, we've we've been expecting a recession mm -hmm. since 2019. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we're, we're just knocking on 2024, right? So mm -hmm. that's the truth. It's been expected. So it hasn't come yet. So it's difficult for anyone to go, nah. Mm -hmm. The recession's coming. And, it's difficult to say that. And that, and that's the, you know, I guess from a business perspective, like, you know, there's this phrase of it's, you know, in, in the UK, we don't say it's about timing the market. It's about time in the market. Mm -hmm. Because if you were the same person that was predicting a recession in 2019, <laughs> you're saying, yeah, 2019 recession's coming. I'm not going to buy. Mm. Okay. Prices went up in 2020. <laughs> okay. COVID's come. I'm not going to buy it. Mm -hmm. Prices went up. Okay, like Brexit's <laughs> calm. I'm not going to buy a price. So it's like, okay, you, you've lost all these opportunities. And the reality is when you look at it, that if you time the market perfectly in 2008, so you got it spot on, you were the only person that predicted it exactly right. Prices dropped by 10%. But if you were to have bought property two years before that, prices still went up relatively in those two years more than that drop. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, if you were the person that was trying to time it in 2019, even if it did drop, if it went up to the level it went up in 2020, 21, 22, 23, you would still be in a better place. Mm -hmm. So if you're flipping properties, i.e. short-term holds, buy something, want to sell it on in the next sort of six to 12 months, you have to be a lot more careful. If you're going to be holding assets for the long term, it doesn't really matter in the same way. Mm -hmm. So I think it really depends on strategy. 100%. Yeah. If you're, you know, we'll just talk about, you know, if you're in the UK mm -hmm. and you're buying to hold, you know, that's what you say with Deborah. Well, yeah, you probably, it's very little risk. As long mm -hmm. as you understand, I'm not looking to sell this. It doesn't yeah. matter. The market can go up, down. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Then, mm -hmm the likelihood of you losing is mm. like we know historically every 12 years the property's going to double in because price. the other thing is prices going up and down don't affect rental prices exactly and if you're holding you're looking at yield exactly. so that going up and down capital appreciation that's almost your bonus and your cherry on top mm -hmm. when you're buying to hold you're looking at yield because you don't see that money anyway 100%. so you know if, if your price say you're in a house and it drops someone says oh you know i bought a house for five hundred thousand and prices have dropped and now it's only worth 450 the tenant's not going to start paying you less rent because it's worth less because <laughs> they don't pay you more rent when it's worth more. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what concerns you based on your investment strategy. And rent only goes one way. Let's yeah, this, right? rent only goes one way. <laughs> Actually, uh, I heard, I don't know if you listened, I followed this, um, this channel, Novara Media, mm -hmm. and they were talking about, they went to the landlord conference just about a month and a half ago and, you know, they were at it. It's a left-wing media, which, you know, I follow. I, lo I love mm -hmm. the content. But um, this particular one, I was just like, like do you not understand because it's easy to pin things on landlords. They're mm. terrible. They're horrible. And there are people out there going, there was a lady out there going like, why should I have to pay for your mortgage? Why should I have to pay for your mortgage? Mm. Well, no, you're paying for accommodation. Mm. You're paying to have a roof over your head, mm. right? That this is the reality. And so now we're talking about, you know, people putting their properties back into the market. Who's buying those properties? Mm. Because there is a cost of living crisis. 
and it's not you know the, the person who just wants to buy it to live. You know, mm. A lot of people don't have this money right now. It's those landlords who are investing, who are taking a risk, yeah. right? And then as a result of that risk they're taking, you've now got a roof over your head. Mm -hmm. If they didn't take that risk, guess what? You're going to be competing with another 10, 15 people for this one fly and that money just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. I think, like, like obviously landlords do have, you know, a, a bad stigma in a lot of circles because it's like, why do you want to own so many properties? Why do you want to own so many assets? But I think it's just, you know, I, I get it to a degree, but the reality is it would only make sense if the government were doing their job of providing the homes, like if the government providing all of the homes required and people were just buying them all up to making them more expensive, but the, the private landlords make up a relatively small percentage of home ownership within the UK. And they also meet a requirement that not everybody wants to own their own home. We're in a generation now where people would much rather rent a lot of products than they than buy. So whereas before people would look to buy a holiday home, now people Airbnb. People, everyone has to have a car. No, I can use I can use Uber. And people are in a service based industry that we're actually as landlords meeting a requirement. And I think whilst rents have gone up, the thing that's good is that alongside rents going up, it means that landlords also now have to deliver more of a service. And tenants, for 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 my part anyway. I see tenants as customers rather than tenants in a separate bracket. Mm -hmm. So you have a requirement to service like, you know, your tenant to make sure that they can enjoy the property. So whereas before a lot of landlords were like accidental landlords and they'd be like, oh, something's broken. They'd be like, well, I don't really know what to do. I'll send someone out when I can find someone. Now we have mm -hmm. a repairs policy in place. I employ somebody to be, you know, my property manager. So they've got a primary point of contact and you get that level of service for what you're paying as well. And I think, you know, so you you get what you pay for in a lot of places. Hundred percent. Now I know you're you're a um, a development guy mm. by today, all of this sort mm. of stuff. But under the current circumstances, so just look at the market, mm -hmm. current market. Think about where you feel the market could be mm. going, or think about maybe even if you were you're wrong on where the market's going. Mm. And I'm just sitting there, I'm trying to get into property. I want to start making money from property. Under these current circumstances, you know, what do you feel is the the best way to go about doing that? I think, so I would say if anybody, like, you know, you see these TikTok, Instagram sound bites, like, this is best for you. They're talking rubbish because, like, what's best for you is based on your circumstances. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what's the best way for you to invest without knowing how much money you have, how much experience you have, your attitude towards risk. It's the same way an accountant can't give you, there's not general advice for how best to invest your money because it's also based on your personal circumstance as well. Mm. Um, so I would say we could look at people in different spaces. Let's do that. For those that are looking to maybe start out, don't have, you know, a lot of capital um, and, you know, looking to get into property. We're in a market where it's definitely a, a buyer's market. Sellers are more... Uh, likely to take deals or offers or opportunities so because those are opportunities you can put together creative you know purchase options like lease option agreements um you can do assisted sales um or you could even just agree a purchase price and then sell that deal on so deal sourcing so lower barrier to entry ways of getting into property uh things that a lot of people that are in the pbk community are now doing and now being able to exercise um, obviously, there is an element of an experience that's required or understanding or knowledge to make sure you do have the relevant education that you're doing things compliantly. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, like, you know, I think flipping properties at the moment with prices potentially dropping or like, stagnating is quite difficult or is more risky. But it's not something that I'm stopping doing because I know that. I can insulate that risk by buying at more competitive prices because of the state of the market. Mm. Um, and then also, I'm also buying properties to hold. So I'm doing a lot of different things within the market. And I would say that there's not a one size fits all. I'd take any opportunities that come that make financial sense. I think that's where my economics degree kicks in. I'm like, look, let me just live in my spreadsheet. What do the numbers say? Mm. Um, and don't just be like, okay, like, because these people are saying do this and this is the buzzword at the moment. Oh yeah, you have to get into commercial to residential conversions. Oh, you have to do rent to rent. You have to do this. It's all about, well, what do you have at your disposal and what makes sense based on the assets that you have? Like if you have a load of time, 
then or you have a load of money or have like a, a cross between the two, what you should do would depend based on your individual circumstance. Mm, so powerful, so powerful. So so what what would be the things that you would say to be looking out for now? Let's let's talk about your So for me, but I could I could yeah. just talk about what I'm looking exactly. out for. So I was doing more residential um conversions. So buying houses, land and building um like small, like less than nine unit blocks of flats. Now, ideally, I wanted to get into the build to rent space, but because of interest rates going up, exiting in build to rent, which means basically building an asset, refinancing to pay yourself back on a buy to let, typically you would have done it at 75% loan to value. Mm -hmm. So you have like, so you have 25% equity and the bank lends you the other 75%. But because of interest rates, that's not as viable anymore because you're looking at closer to 65%, which means you leave more money in, have less money to go again at the end of the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've pivoted slightly out of that. And for the stuff that I'm looking to retain now, I'm focusing on building like mini HMOs. So these are HMOs in London, but typically buying like large flats above commercial spaces. So you can get them at a really good price, turning them into four to five bed all on suite HMOs and they yield really well. Uh, Great you know. idea. So mo most recent ones that we're doing, both of them after refinancing, they're, they're not hundred percent money out but we end up at about 11% loan to value from our own capital that we have in the deal, cash flowing positively about 2,000 pounds a month. So repayment periods about 18 months. Exactly. So, you know, you, you build up 2,000 pounds a month of additional profits um, per unit. So if you pick up 10 of those, you have, if you had 200,000 pounds, for example, you could pick up 10 in the space of a year, or sorry, five of them in the space of a year pay yourself back after 18 months and then have a pretty passive income of around 10,000 pounds per calendar month. So that's kind of my focus probably over the next, yeah, 18 months to just pick up five of those. Nice. I love that, bro. I love that. That is insane. What a great strategy because actually you're solving two things. You're solving, you know, the, I guess you could, you could call it a, a problem we're going to market space right now mm. because even people, even couples who would like to go and mm. rent their own flat maybe, the reality is affordability in London mm -hmm. doesn't actually create that space. So people are not having this co-living things, mm -hmm. you know, and the high level HMOs mm -hmm. is where the market's shifting to, mm -hmm. you know, and you're not going to have a shortage of, of end users, right? Yeah, I mean, look, like, I've been doing HMOs. I think my first ever Homes Under the Hammer was like a HMO conversion. I think that was 20, I want to say 15, yeah. something like that. And that was, again, like all on suites, entry phones, TVs on the wall, like nice kind of feature walls and stuff. And we've just gone to Excel and, you know, try and create really nice properties. But I have an affinity. I enjoy interior design. I like to create places that people love. And if you create really nice rooms... In, people aren't as concerned if their property is above commercial. If it's in great transport links, looks really nice. That's so you still get really good money for the rooms, mm. but you're creating high value properties. When we look across the demographic of our tenant base, we've got doctors, lawyers, police officers, accountants, nurses, you know, because the reality is their starting salaries are, you know, sort of 24,000 pounds. So it's not necessarily affordable to rent the nice one bedroom flat and not be just basically working working to live so they can rent somewhere where they can still save and we've had some amazing stories where people have rented rooms from us you know and they've told me that oh during this period i've saved this amount of money and then they've gone on and you know bought their own property so you do see the as much as hmo landlords people are like, oh you're squeezing people in and there is a bit of a, of a negative stigma if you was to do a, a you know a survey of my tenants i think like you know they love it there they love it in these properties because you're creating homes for people within like homes within homes that's amazing and, and yeah people always have these negative um, impressions of landlords which is weird mm. and i really think it comes from the government because the more people are looking at landlords the less they're looking at the government and you know yeah. their lack of you know accountability yeah there's a lot of blame game stuff like the go like landlords are an easy target in the same way you know immigrants are an easy target they tick an easy box to get people up in you know up in arms but i think we, we serve a purpose and for me you know i I, I'm not saying I'm the perfect landlord, but I think if it was to speak to my tenants, you know, we try and make sure we look after them as much as possible. And I've had some amazing, now that I'm on social media, I often get to interact with the people that buy the properties that we develop. And mm -hmm. I remember getting a DM about a year ago from um, this house that I did in out in Epsom, which is sort of just outside London in Surrey. 
but I did it to the standard as if I was doing a you know really nice house in London. Um, I got a message and I was like, oh, hi, like we bought this house. And I was thinking, oh, they're going to be complaining about, you know, a leak or something. They were like, oh, I just wanted to know if you have got a copy of the um, warranty for the microwave because it stopped working. I said, oh, no problem. Sent it over to them, found it in the records. And then she just sent me a really nice message just to say, like, I still can't believe that I live in a house this nice. Wow. And it was just nice to see that, you know, as much as we do get this negative stigma that you're actually creating homes where people are building families. And I always try and think about who's going to live in this property and how can I take like my, you know, decade of experience to create obviously within the budget, but the best home possible. That's incredible, man. And I think that's why even in this market where people are struggling to sell, we're at the moment, we've just sold two properties. We sold one for asking price, one for above asking price um, in this market. And these properties are listed, some of them for like a hundred thousand pounds more than the other free bed within the local area because of the standard that we've gone to finish them to. And if you, are in a market where there's an abundance of supply, you need to be able to have that own USP in your property that when people are trying to give you a low ball offer, you're like, there's no comparables. Mm -hmm. If you want this, this is the price. <laughs> like in the same way that, you know, Prada, Celine, Louis Vuitton, they don't do discounts. If you want the products from those high-end brands that have created that USP of like an amazing finish or amazing styling, you have a pay for it or you get something else. There's no negotiation. <laughs> But I, I think if if you guys don't take anything else away from this, like that is an incredible point there, which is just just set yourself apart from everyone else mm. and create something that even though the price people are like, oh, I don't know, but it's like, what well, do you know what? Mm. It is that good. It is that good. Uh, if I want it, then I'm just going to have to, you know, do what I've got to do to actually make it happen. Yeah, or you do it the complete opposite way and you do stuff like, you know, there's businesses that thrive, Primark are absolutely thriving, but they do it at a certain price point. They do a certain quality, certain price point, certain delivery and do mass market. Mm. Some do really high end, lower sales, lower volume, but much higher margins. And Separate I think, yourself. yeah, don't just bounce in between and be a little bit of everything. Like have, always think about on conception, who am I going to sell this to and how much and how could I justify that sales price? Hmm. Well, wow, bro, honestly, this has been incredible. I was hoping because that was this is the first time I've actually met you in person. You know? And um, like you said, when we were first talking at the start, I was like, yeah, he ain't giving sound bites. Like, just this is just from our yeah. conversation. I was like, this guy. A mad struggle to give. Like, I feel like I'm always, like, I think when I talk. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, uh, this. So it's never going to be the sound bite, but I know we're in amazing studios. What's the name of the studios? LTV. L LTV. We're in LTV. I know they're going to edit up and they're going to make me sound like the Soundback King. So you've got the great <laughs> editors and that's why I have great people. So where my weaknesses are, find somebody else's strengths so that they can, you know, they can push that. 100%. And make it better. Bro. But thank you so much. I feel like it's been really, really valuable. There's definitely so much that people can take from that, from your journey, and even just from the knowledge, the property space, what you've discussed um, about that. So um, I'm super, super excited. And okay. thank you so much for coming down as well, thank bro. Thank you, brother. Thank you for having me. But before me. we wrap you up, like I said, there's one more question, mm -hmm. which is the final question um, and the second set question of the okay, show. Okay, cool. Which is with, with everything that you've achieved, bro, like, you know, you're, you're talking mm. about these numbers and you're talking very non, you mm. know, nonchalantly about it, right? But this mm. is this is big. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, where you come from, you know, you're mm -hmm. just, I mean, how many other people, you grew up in London, yeah? Yeah, yeah. How many other people grew up in London, you know, young black kid, you know, you're doing big things. If mm -hmm. people don't know, just follow this guy, Property by Kazi, he's doing deals. He's talking about developments, nine units, this and that. Like, this is not a small thing, you know, yeah? <laughs> this is a dumb thing because he's just saying, you know, not chilting. <laughs> like, it's a, these are big things that mm -hmm. he's doing. So with, with all of that, though, like, what remains your need to succeed? Um, I feel like, like, it's kind of like sort of to a degree is like heavy as the head, like, you know, like, so that the saying that obviously heavy as the head that wears the crown. So for me, the more <laughs> you succeed, the more you have people that rely on you or that look up to you. And I think if you put yourself on a, on a platform where you're like, you know what, this is where I am. For me, it's like, it's a massive fear to be like, to ever, to not be that guy. So for every day I wake up and I'm like, you know what? Like, I just, I need to be the best me that I am for myself, for my own ego, which is some could look at as a shortfall, but I think that's what pushes me. Like that I do have an ego that I'm like, you know what? I want to be the best. And then alongside that, like I've, 
I've got people within my, my family and I always talk about probably one of the people that's closest to me is my little sister. Like she, when we were young, she unfortunately had a stroke. Um, she now suffers from epilepsy and a number of other takes like, you know, sort of sometimes I have to take like 20 tablets a day. But I always say like that girl there, like she's like my rock because with all of that, everything she's gone through, being partially like paralyzed, like losing sight, all of these things, like she never gives up. She keeps working. She said, I don't want to do no disability. I'm going to work. She's always worked herself. And I look at it and I say, if she can do all of that with like so little or so much hardships, like I must be able to like do amazing things. And it's like, if she didn't have those unfortunate opportunities, like unfortunate things that happened to her, if I'm here, she'd be here. So I'm like, I just got to try and like keep pushing because I'm like, look, cause you couldn't, I'm going to do it for both of us. So whatever you need, like you're going to be good. I'm going to be good. Family's going to be good. So I think having people in your life that you love and care about, you know, is, is always going to be a massive driver. Wow, that's amazing, bro. Mm. What a great way to end it, man. Appreciate you, my bro. Kazim Ali Balogun, thank you very much, bro. Appreciate you. Appreciate everyone. Thank you for having me on, my bro. You are listening to the Need to Succeed podcast with Ibrahim Brahma. Make sure to like and subscribe for more episodes like this.